We are studying the Gospel of Luke, and we are letting Luke show us things about our great Jesus, and he will take us to a new place today. I grew up with a hero in my family, at least that's how I saw it. I have an aunt who spent years in the jungles of Peru, reaching out to an extremely remote tribe by the name of the Kulina Madiha. And when she first left to make contact with this tribe, one of those first contact kind of situations, the path there ended with a two-day transportation in one of those dugout canoes just for her to reach this group of people that had no contact with outside society. She went there with Wycliffe Bible translators. She learned their language. She deciphered their language. She gave them letters. She wrote their language. Things began to change in that village. They eventually made an airstrip so that medicine could come in, so that a few vital things could be provided for those people. And one day, one of the men of the village uh, was involved in a severe accident. It's the kind of accident that although my aunt was a trained nurse, she knew if he did not make it to a full-service hospital, he would die. And so for the very first time, it was decided that they would take someone out of the village. The airplane came in, and they flew this individual out, and he entered into an entirely new world. He saw a city. He saw a hospital. He saw medical intervention, the kind that he had never dreamed of. When he went back to that village, everybody was out when the plane landed, and they all had questions for him. My aunt was there to watch the interaction, and one person asked this individual, So tell us, what is it like to go to the other side? Now, in their lingo, the way that they talked is that everything within the borders of where they lived in the jungle, that was their world, and everything else was the other side. And since he was the first person to go beyond those borders, the question was natural. What is it like on the other side? And that individual stopped. He took quite a little bit of time before he answered, and his answer was this. He said, well, actually... I didn't go to the other side. I went to the other side of the other side. You kind of get what he was trying to say, don't you? What he said to his peers was this. He says, I've been with you, and we've talked about what the other side is like. We've imagined it. We've envisioned it. We thought it would be like this or like that. But what I saw was so completely different than anything that we imagined. If you think I was at what we were talking about before, the other side, You are not far enough. I went to the other side of the other side. Now, a comment like that would be very humbling for those people who lived in that tribe because they kind of thought that they knew what was out there, and they discovered through his words that they didn't know what was out there. You and I, as we explore the things of God, oftentimes find ourselves exploring the other side of the other side. While we might have started with the presupposition of we kind of got this thing figured out, once God opens up the truth and says what's going on in his realm, we go, oh my goodness, that is so different than what I ever imagined. And on this day, Luke, I believe, is going to take us to the other side of the other side so that we can understand who this person Jesus is. We're going to be reading from Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning in the 31st verse to the end of the chapter, and we're going to see Jesus, the Messiah, the one who is full of power. These are the words of Luke. Then he, Jesus, went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he taught the people, and they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit, He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed, and they said to each other, What words are these? With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue, and he went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. 
So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. And at daybreak... Jesus went to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Father God, we thank you for these words. We thank you that Luke was dedicated to telling us who Jesus is. And we would ask that by your inspiration and illumination that we would get it, that we would understand this message that you have sent to the generations of who your son is. So open our eyes and open our hearts. We look forward to hearing your words. Amen. Last week, our text had Jesus in his hometown. It was the town of Nazareth, incredibly small, and they didn't really receive him well, and so he hits the road. One week passes, he's in another synagogue. This time, he had traveled a good little piece. He had made his way to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was not a small town. This was at a major crossroads of all of the trade routes. This was a hustling and bustling city. And Jesus pulled into Capernaum. And on the Sabbath day, he did what he was doing on the Sabbath day. He went to the synagogue and he was teaching. Now, for most people who have the opportunity to visit Galilee, they do make a stop in Capernaum on the beautiful shores of the water. And they particularly go and they stop at what is the synagogue of Capernaum. It's uh, rather well preserved. And they can walk on the very stones, the very place where Jesus walked. Here is where these events took place. They come by the thousands. And on that day in Capernaum, Jesus not only teaches, but he is involved in a huge powerful confrontation. It is a confrontation in which Jesus addresses a demon, and that happens in a synagogue. Now, I realize today that we might be a little bit surprised for an event like that to happen in a synagogue. We sort of feel like, well, isn't that a strange place for a demon to be showing up? And and I think the reason why we feel it's strange is we're actually affected by trends in modern literature and what we see on television. And uh, Fanciful writers who don't necessarily study the book that we're studying, they have presuppositions like, you know, if they insert an evil demon or something into their, their plot, they, uh, they actually have people running into churches trying to protect themselves from the evil spirit, sort of like that's supposed to be really helpful, and so we see that in all of our plots time and time again. I want you to know that as Luke was writing his gospel, that thought never crossed his mind. In fact, the first two times that you see evil spirits, or even Satan himself, you'd be surprised where they show up. So chapter 3, just before our chapter 4, Satan comes and tempts Jesus. And do you remember where Satan took Jesus? He took him to the top of the temple. Now that happens to be the tallest building in all of Israel. It actually is the most holy building in all of Israel. And it seems to be presented by Luke that Satan had no problem strolling on the rafters of the temple above the holy place. He had no problem with that whatsoever. And he said, throw yourself down, and Jesus didn't listen to him. Well, then the very next time that somebody shows up and they have an evil spirit, it happens in a synagogue. And it seems that this person with an evil spirit just sort of strolled into that service, was having absolutely no problem with the songs that were being sung, with the texts that were being read. He was just hanging out there in the synagogue until... That evil spirit was deeply surprised. And he was not surprised by the synagogue building. He was surprised by who was in that synagogue building. And when he sees Jesus, he is riveted by fear, and he cries out with these words, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Now, while it is true in the Gospel of Luke that he portrays that the enemies of God seem to have little or no respect or appreciation for buildings of religious places, while they don't respect buildings, they certainly respect Jesus. 
And they recognize that he has power, he has authority, and he cries out. He cannot suppress his fear, and he cannot hold his tongue in the presence of Jesus of Nazareth. And on that day, the tables are turned for this evil spirit, who for quite some time experienced this sort of reality. You see evil spirits show up, and people get scared and frightened. But on this day, there are not people who are scared and frightened. On this day, the demon meets a person, and it is the demon who is scared and frightened. Throughout the years, that demon had had a track record of bringing ruin to the quality of people's lives. That demon had brought disturbing and unwanted change to other people. But on this day, the unwanted and disturbing change is not brought to people, but it is brought to that unclean spirit because that unclean spirit meets someone new. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth. And we see a moment in which the bully meets his match. And his match is good and holy and righteous. And he is identified as Jesus It's fascinating that in the first few verses that we read, the most important message for us to hang on to actually is spoken by the demon. The words that it utters are words that are incredibly important. For that demon recognizes who Jesus is. And he pulls together two different phrases. He says this. He says, you, Jesus of Nazareth, I know your name and other people know your name. And now what I want to say is not just your name, but I want to say what you are. You are the Holy One of God. Now when Jesus visited Nazareth, and I believe when he visited Capernaum, everybody was asking a question, who is this Jesus? I wonder who it is. But there is someone who has crystal clarity on who Jesus is. And that happens to be the evil spirit. There's no question in the angelic realms who Jesus of Nazareth is. And Jesus does something which is amazing, and he does something which is powerful. He strikes fear into the heart of this being. And it cries out, have you come to destroy us? Because it knows what is the end of the game. It knows that in the end it will be destroyed, that God will rule, and it fears that that day has come. And so we learn from this evil spirit that Jesus is holy. He is powerful. He drives fear into the demons, and we are impressed. And it raises a question for us, doesn't it? And the question that we have as we're watching this interchange is what kind of person strikes fear into angelic beings? Not just anyone. And what Luke is explaining to us is this. Look, you have to understand something, that Jesus is more powerful than what anyone has imagined. And he is now going to start showing us what kind of power that is. In fact, what he's going to do is he's going to start to part the curtain. And as he parts the curtain, he's going to start showing us what is true about the other side of the other side. And the curtain begins to part in a synagogue in Capernaum, and we begin to learn about Jesus. And what do we see happens? So interesting. Jesus but says a word. He reaches for no weapon. He asks for no help. There ensues no wrestling match. He says a word, and instant obedience is necessary on the part of that evil spirit. That is how powerful he is. And as Jesus does this, he already starts to fulfill what he just said last week about himself. Now, if you were here last week, he read a text from Isaiah that describes who the Messiah is and what the Messiah will do. And just last week in a different synagogue, he said, I am fulfilling that text right now. Well, Jesus gets at the fulfillment immediately because in that text, the Messiah, he will come and he will release the captives and Jesus wastes no time in releasing the captives, even those who are held captive by his enemy. This is Jesus, the Messiah, showing us who he is. So all hail, all hail the power 
of Jesus' name. It happened in the synagogue. Well, after that exchange, Jesus takes a quick trip to Simon's house. This would be Simon Peter's house. And if you had the opportunity to visit Capernaum, you'd be surprised at how close archaeologists say Simon's house was to the synagogue. In fact, I think it would take you a whole of two minutes to walk from one to the other. It's sort of like from where you are to the end of the parking lot. And as Jesus walks into that house, he meets someone who was not in the synagogue that day. Because there was someone who was ill. They had a, a high fever. You've probably had a high fever too. I've, I've experienced those yucky moments. Those moments in which, um, man, your whole world closes in on you. Uh, time passes and you don't even notice it. You can hardly collect your thoughts. You're so affected by that fever. And you and I, we don't get too concerned about that in the day of penicillin, antibiotics, and steroids. We kind of go, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of this. We're good at that. In this day, uh, high fevers could be life-threatening. And so these people who had just seen Jesus, he was cast out a demon. They say, can you help this woman? And it says that Jesus approached her and he bent over her and he rebuked the fever. Very interesting words. Now, if you and I had been there, I guarantee you that this would have not been our tactic because we don't talk to fevers. We don't give them instructions. We don't think that a fever has the capacity to listen to our words. That doesn't seem to make any sense. In fact, if you want to say something like that, you had better be from the other side of the other side. Because that doesn't work for us. And when Jesus spoke to that fever, that fever responded. And she got up immediately. She got active immediately. She has no fatigue. She needs no recovery period. And she is not suffering from dehydration. All is well when Jesus speaks. That is remarkable. And what is it that Luke is trying to tell us about Jesus? He's trying to say, look, this Jesus is also Lord of the physical universe. And the more that we study medicine and the more that we understand what happens when someone has a fever, the more we're amazed at what Jesus did because his words spoke and it caused action all the way down to the cellular level. And there was no problem for him to do that. This Jesus is powerful. In this chapter, there is power lesson number one. The demons will do what he says. Power lesson number two. The physical universe will respond to his voice. This is not just anyone. The day is not finished. And Luke continues to describe what happened. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. They were laying their hands on each one of them and he healed them. Now, if you were to try to plot this on a little bit of a time chart, you might be a little interested the way I am because the synagogue probably ended hours before sunset. Jesus goes and he heals a person, and it's like he's there and hanging out a little bit by himself until sunset. Well, why all the passing of time? I mean, if you knew that somebody was healing someone over there, wouldn't she show up a little bit faster? And this detail simply tells us that we have a thoroughly Jewish story reflecting the culture of the day. Because the Jews in Capernaum, they were observing the Sabbath. And uh, the rules that they had with Sabbath, they were rather strict. In fact, on the Sabbath, you were only allowed to walk a certain distance before you would be accused of working on the Sabbath. And the truth is that some of the people, as they made it to the synagogue and went back home, they had already spent all of the steps that they were allowed on the Sabbath. And as news spread of Jesus healing them, they're like, we have got to get there, but we can't get there yet. Because the Sabbath is the Sabbath until the sun goes down. And when the sun goes down, it's no longer the Sabbath. We're no longer constrained by how many steps we can have. In fact, we can start carrying things. And they started to carry their friends. And they started to carry their relatives. And they brought them to Jesus. And it says that Jesus at that time, that he healed them all. This is no mere trickle of power which is coming from Jesus. And he is demonstrating to us that he is a powerful Lord of all. 
Now, these words, which were such a surprise for them, I don't think that they're so surprising for us because we've bumped into this Jesus who's powerful and we've seen him work in our lives. And, and that's why when we come here and when people come up and they go, we're now going to start singing, probably in your soul you kind of go, this is good <laughs> because we want to honor this powerful Lord that we have. We want to say that we love and we care about him. There's no one who would merit praise, and so we're going to give him praise. And that's what we do because we have met a powerful Lord by the name of Jesus. And that causes us just to act differently than other people. Our choices might be other, and that's okay that they're other. I mean, you know what it's like. You go home, you flick on the television, and you can't help but go a couple minutes before you start hearing the name of God and the name of Jesus used in some very strange ways. In fact, uh, their names are, are used more flippantly than they are reverently. It just kind of happens and happens and happens. And, and you know, uh, what happens for you and, and me is, is we kind of try to avoid that, even though that's the big current and trend. And why do we try to do that? It's because we know him. And we know who he is, that he is the powerful Lord of the universe. And it just feels like, no, I'm not going to talk that way about him. And, and if other people say, well, we're different, so be it, we actually have met him, and it affects who we are and what we do. And this brings us now to the text that I actually believe is the most intriguing of the entire passage. It comes at the end of what we read. As we get to the last verses, Luke writes this, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place, and the people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. Of course they did. I mean, this is your best health insurance plan ever, <laughs> and it's local, and you do not want it to leave. And Jesus' response to them is this, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent, and he kept preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And Jesus uttered these words, I must. Well, just be honest with you. After Jesus has just demonstrated more power than anyone has ever demonstrated in Israel, for him to follow up those two events with the words, I must, has got to catch us off guard a little bit. And we're going to have to talk about this word, must. It's not our favorite word. And the reason why it's not our favorite word is when the word must comes around into your life, immediately what you're going to feel like is, well, when must shows up, my freedoms begin to diminish. You see, there might be things that I want to do, but I can't do what I want to do because I must do this other thing. I mean, I would have loved to have been with you guys, but I had to go to work. That's what my boss says. I just got to be there, so I'm not free to do all of that. And yeah, I would have liked to have been part of that, but I must pick my son up from practice, that's non-negotiable. And, and we find that when must comes into our life, that it feels like our freedoms are limited and they get smaller, and we pine away for what a life would be like in which we are immune from must. And in fact, we sort of imagine what it would be like to be those people who we think are immune from the word must. I mean, let's be honest. Does Kanye, do Kanye and Kim cook and do their own dishes? Do they vacuum and wipe the paws of their dog? You're going, no, I don't think they do that. And neither does Mr. Gates or Mr. Buffett or Mr. Zuckerberg. And when we start thinking about these people that we don't know and we don't really know how they live, we start going, you know what, it would be so cool to be like them because they live above the must. These people, they're so powerful, they're so rich, they can do whatever it is they want, and we would like to be like them. And I want to graph for you what our thinking is on the word must. It goes like this. Um, must seems to have different gradations of intensity. And when you have absolutely no power, when you're the bottom of the totem pole, so everybody who's going to school right now, <laughs> bottom of the totem pole, oh, look at all this stuff I must do. I must do my homework. I must wake up. I must. It's like, I would really like to get rid of all this must. And our thought is that as I gain in power, here's going to be the cool thing. I'm going to start dropping all of these musts that I have in my life, and I'm going to get a chance to be more independent. And I'm hoping that one day I'm going to reach this level. And when I get to that level, you know what's above must? There is total freedom, and I can't wait to be there. That's the life that I would really like to have, and that's what you and I think about must. 
And if there was ever anybody who could have experienced total freedom, would it not be Jesus the Messiah? And yet Jesus the Messiah says, I must do something. Rather odd, isn't it? It's so strange that he has to do something because what is his power like? Well, when the devil tempted him and said, if you're hungry, take these stones and turn them into bread, I want you to know that that was not an exaggeration. He could have turned those stones into bread without dirtying a mixing bowl or turning on an oven. He wouldn't break a sweat in doing it. He has all power. He has all authority. He can do what he wants. And he says, there are things that I must do. And immediately that surprises us because our presuppositions take us in a different direction. Here's what you and I presuppose. We suppose the more powerful I am, the more I get to do what I want. Isn't that interesting how that kind of connects inside of us? The more influence I have, well then, the more self-serving I'm going to become. And so we actually think that the super powerful are going to be super self-absorbed. And there are some people who are super self-absorbed. But we cannot apply that thought to Jesus of Nazareth, who came to do the will of his Father. And it is a worthy study to see how many times Jesus says he must do something and what he talks about each time he says it. It takes me into a place in which I go, I'm a little stuck here. I thought that if you're super powerful, you could do whatever you want. Jesus is more than super powerful, and there's things that he must do. How does that work? And while Scripture doesn't explain it, I'm going to take a stab at it and why that really works. It works because there is something else that you and I talk about, and when we experience it, it is overwhelming. It is something that we call the power of love. And the power of love is something that we cherish. The the power of love is one of those things that causes a mother to make an endless stream of of self-sacrificing decisions for their family. The power of love causes a person with great ambition to set those aside because he or she cares for someone else. The power of love causes a friend to change their schedule, causes us to go down on our knees to pray for people that we care about. The power of love. And Jesus was full of love. And his love generates a must. There are things that he must do for the sake of love. And Jesus describes what it is that he must do. His must has a what, and it has a scope or an extent. What is it that he must do? He declares, I must preach the kingdom of God. This is a non-negotiable for me. There is a God, and there are people who are distant from him, and I must explain the way that we can be united with him That is why I've been sent, and I will not stop doing that. And with what scope and to what extent will I do that? Well, I will have to go to other towns and other cities. I cannot stay and just take care of you. I'm going to hit the road because this message of the kingdom of God, it must go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth until it gets to a tribe by the name of the Kulina Madiha in the jungles of Peru. It must get there because it is driven by the power of God's love. And because of the power of God's love, you and I have bumped into, rubbed shoulders with, and heard about this mighty kingdom of God. And it had to come to us so that God would be glorified and that we would have a chance to get to know him. The almighty, powerful Jesus has something that he must do. And what he must do is he must go to the cross so that you and I can be connected with our great and glorious Lord. This is the portrait of Jesus that Luke gives us. He says, Theophilus, I have written this to you so that you will have certainty, that so you will know who he is. Who is he? Even the demons cry out and say he's the Messiah. They call him the Holy God. He does the work of the Messiah. He releases the captives. He gives sight to the blind. This is the promised one, and he's telling us what he's going to do. I'm going to preach the kingdom of God to everyone so that we can all know him. Praise be the name of our God. This is changes everything.